at the center of at the center for healthcare innovation look at the center of uh Healthcare innovation is located on the ancestral and current land and waters of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Ojibwe Cree, Dakota, and the Denisulim peoples, and on the land, national homeland of the Red Meat River Metis. In northern Manitoba, we acknowledge the ancestral lands of the Inuit and gratefully acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake Forty First Nation. At CHI, we respect the spirit, intent, and language within the treaties that were made on these lands and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and present. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Benedict C. Albensi. Uh, Dr. Benedict C. Albensi is a professor and chair of the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. His Alzheimer's disease research revolves both involves both animal models and clinical trials approaches. He obtained his PhD in neuroscience from the University of Utah's medical school in 1995. Subsequently, he was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship at the Georgetown University in Washington, DC. He then went on to work as postdoctoral scholar at the Sanders Brown Center on Aging, University of Kentucky. Some of his other appointments include uh, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, the Department of Neurological Surgery, NPS Pharmaceuticals, Pfizer, uh, the Department of uh, Clinical Research, Case Western University, he was the instructor of the uh, Department of uh, Biology, St. Boniface Hospital Research Center, Winnipeg, Principal Investigator, Division of Neurogener Neurogenerative Disorders, He's also, he's also a tenured professor, tenured full professor at the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics, University of Manitoba. He is best known for his work with factors involved in aging, cognition, and Alzheimer's disease, such as nuclear factor Kappa B, a mediator of inflammation. His work has also focused on mitochondrial dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. Recently, the Albensi lab has shown very early uh, deficits and sex-based differences in mitochondrial function before the appearance of plaques and tangles, the classic uh, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. He has been ranked in the top 1% worldwide by expertscape.com for his number of publications from 2010 to 2020 in seven years, including Alzheimer's disease at 0.48%, uh, Neurocognitive disorders at 0.76%, tall parties at 0.98%, dementia at 0.85%, NF kappa B at 0.42%, memory at 68%, and energy metabolism at 0.68%. He is ranked number one in Florida for his, for his number of publications on NF KB, NF kappa B. Uh, so I'm just going to invite Dr. Albensi to go ahead now and uh, share his um, screen and um, go on with his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see if I can get this to work again. Okay, how's that? Can you see me and see my slides and can you hear me? Um, I think you're muted, so I, I can't hear. Oh, okay. Okay, good. I see a thumbs yeah. up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Well, thank you to the organizers um, for inviting me today at the George Fay Yee Center for Healthcare Innovation and also the local uh, Sokra Winnipeg chapter. I used to be a member of this Winnipeg Sokra chapter, so it's really exciting and I'm honored to be able to speak to your group today. So here are my disclosures. And so today, today I wanna to talk about Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, and we'll start by looking at the current state of affairs with Alzheimer's. Uh, We'll look at the uh, some aspects of diagnosis and where we're at 
Uh, regionally, we'll also look at some overall challenges and try to uh, depict some of the uh, specific examples and the challenges. We'll also look at some of the challenges I faced in my clinical trial that I conducted in Canada that recently uh, was completed a few months ago. And then we'll wrap things up by discussing some of the opportunities that I think that we have and perhaps have not been taking advantage of uh, over the years. So let's get started. So dementia was originally defined as madness or without mind, and, and some professionals have tried to change the official terminology with the DSM-5, otherwise known as the D Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and because of the stigma attached. And so now, officially, it's actually termed a major cognitive disorder. But unfortunately, the word dementia is still used by even healthcare professionals. Now, almost everyone has a story when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, and this is my mom, and I know her story very well. But one thing I'd like to remind people, especially healthcare practitioners, is that the patient's path is much different than our path. And people have good days, but really more bad days. And if your trial participant is not cooperating, really think about giving them a break and take into account the patient's perspective. We'll talk more about this later when we talk about opportunities to improve trials by specifically incorporating patient feedback. But first and foremost, we really don't know what causes Alzheimer's disease. And this is uh, important to say up front. It's a huge challenge facing us in, in basic research, translational, and clinical research. Now, we know that aging is the greatest risk factor. But it's important to note that Alzheimer's disease is really a multifactorial condition. And what I mean is that it involves both environmental and genetic factors that come together to play a role. Now, some of the classic hallmarks of Alzheimer's you may have heard about already are the sticky amyloid uh, plaques, the toxic plaques, and also the filamentous tangles associated with hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. However, many other factors, processes, and mechanisms are being studied that could also potentially cause Alzheimer's disease. Now, another key point is that Alzheimer's disease is still underdiagnosed throughout the world, and there are several reasons for this, and we'll talk a little bit about these influences. Um, and I talk about this at great length in these two papers that I show here that we published from my team. Now, according to a 2021 World Alzheimer's Report, 41 million cases of dementia actually go undiagnosed globally, which is about 75% of all dementia cases. One reason is that physicians are dramatically underdiagnosing early cognitive decline. Some challenges exist yet with diagnosing the early stages with regard to symptom variability and discrimination for the specific type of disorder. So another challenge. Also a huge challenge has to do with access and availability, which also we'll talk more about in a few seconds. Now, as you can see, we have identified some of the advantages and po potential disadvantages in, in our paper, and I list some of these here, uh, using artificial intelligence, which is very trendy right now. Uh, but there's certainly some advantages uh, for using AI in Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. So, for example, AI can improve accuracy and efficiencies uh, in radiographic data. This has been shown before in breast cancer uh, radiographic data. But there are concerns, of course, uh, getting physicians to agree on its use and finding a, a so-called gold standard that is a standard of care, and then also potential problems with privacy that might occur. Now, with regard to stigmas, in general, mental illness sometimes still is associated with a stigma. In other words, some people believe that it's a disgrace to that person or the family for having mental illness in general or dementia. And really, really what I want you to realize is that having a stigma or overcoming a stigma uh, is really connected to barriers of getting support. So overall stigmas can be a barrier to uh, proper support. In medieval times, those with dementia were often described as childlike or foolish. But even in this day and age, some people think that mental illness and dementia is something to be feared or kept secret, even by healthcare professionals. Which takes us to look at regional differences. 
Now, stigmas actually exist, not just with the lay public, but also with healthcare practitioners, and this varies by region or country. When my mom was in a, a rest home, uh, the director of the facility, who was actually a nurse by training, told me that I shouldn't visit my mom anymore and recommended that I take that I take I do not take my kids there uh, to see their grandma either. So this was a bit shocking to me. And I, I think it was really her view is that it was because of her agitation and aggression that she routine, routinely displayed uh, in her day to day activities. But I really believe that she said this in part because of her own biases and perhaps her uh, stigmatizing perspective that she held. So stigmas and biased perspectives can include physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and other practitioners. And in this study that I show in this slide here, it was a study conducted worldwide where healthcare practitioners were asked a series of questions. I'm just going to point out two of the questions. So on the left side is a, a, a breakdown of country by country, and it's and the question that's being asked in that panel is, are people with dementia dangerous? And one can see that in the USA, about 8% of healthcare practitioners thought that those with dementia perhaps were dangerous. But in countries like Indonesia and Thailand, almost 70% of the healthcare workers there thought that dementia, that those with dementia were dangerous. The overall average across the world was about 15%. When asked the second question, that is, would you try to keep dementia a secret? 40% of health, uh, Russian healthcare practitioners would advise to keep dementia a secret. On average, about 20% of all the countries agreed with this position, which is very unfortunate in my view. So importantly to know, throughout the world, someone is diagnosed with dementia once every three seconds a staggering number. In Manitoba, there's almost 20,000 people with some form of dementia, and by the year 2050, this number will almost double. Now, here's a paper that we published while I was still in Winnipeg that focuses on these numbers and also the future economic trends uh, that we see in Manitoba. So I invite you to read that if you have a chance. But here's a summary of what we found. We found that overall, there were dramatic increases in the rates of dementia in Manitoba. Now, the largest projected increase that we found seemed to be in those that, was in the, uh, that will be in the 75 to 84 year old bracket, and this will occur by the year 2035. Also, surprisingly, the prevalence of dementia will arise from 31% to 79% by the year 2045 in men that are 85 and older. But surprisingly, we see almost no change in women in the same age bracket. And we're not sure how to explain this at this time. But overall, the overall economic burden is expected to grow by 28 billion US dollars by the year 2028. And this of course will have consequences for everyone. Now, currently throughout the world, there's about 55 million people that have dementia of one form or another. And of course, Alzheimer's disease is just one type of dementia that comprises about 70 to 80% of all the cases. You can see here in this graph that about 9 million people in Central America, South America, and North America are afflicted with some form of dementia. Over 750,000 Canadians are living with Alzheimer's or another dementia. And in the USA, we have about 6 million that now have uh, Alzheimer's disease. One should also notice that in Asia, the highest rates are about 23 million cases. This hasn't always been the case. And just a few years ago, this number was much lower. Again, we're not sure why, but it might uh, lie with the reporting systems that are used in Asia. But much of the increase that we expect to see over the next 30 years will probably take place in low and middle income countries. Now, USA, of course, we have a lot of regional variation, state by state variation, and Alzheimer's disease is on the rise in general, but especially in some states. So in this graph, we uh, in Florida in particular, where I now live, over 500,000 people have Alzheimer's disease with about 850,000 people that are taking on the role of their caregiver. So really another staggering number. The highest rates in the US right now though, seem to be in the states of Alaska, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, and so on, uh, as depicted by the darker purple shading in this figure. 
Now, this might be due to the more remote or rural populations that these states have, but again, this is not clear. So in addition to the rising numbers everywhere, we have special problems, as we just stated, especially in more rural or remote areas. So for example, seeing a doctor easily and quickly is something that many of us are able to do in urban areas, but we take this for granted, and this luxury does not exist for those in more remote areas. And in Canada, of course, there are many remote communities in the north that have no doctors, and telehealth is the only uh, choice they have, if, of course, they had a computer with computer access to the internet. So as you can imagine, compliance with medications is also always a struggle, and those with dementia can get easily confused. And if they're living in a remote area, they're not oftentimes monitored uh, whether or not they're taking their daily medication. Also safe driving and not getting lost are additional challenges for those with dementia. This happened to my, my aunt and we had to take her keys away at one point. Um, but especially in a rural area where you have to drive everywhere uh, is an additional challenges. So other challenges include firearms in the home, and then finally, being in a remote region also reduces the capacity for optimal care that one might be receiving uh, if they lived in a more urban environment. Okay, let's focus now on some of the challenges. We already talked a bit about diagnosis and regional differences, but here's a list of general challenges. Alzheimer's disease uh, trials are slow to recruit participants. This can occur in both rural areas and metro areas like Washington, D.C. This happened to one of my colleagues, Dr. Scott Turner, who is a, the director of the memory clinic at Georgetown University. Uh, referrals to trials can also be infrequent due to physicians not having enough time to evaluate clinical study information, or there might be a lack of resources for patients for clinical trials, or concerns if, uh, about risks to the patient. Now, some trials, such as Alzheimer's disease trials, take a long time to complete, and it's thought that this might be due to the lengthy time for the disease to progress, but also the time to complete such tests, such as MRI and PET scanning, et cetera. Now, Alzheimer's disease trials are the most expensive trials. It might be, uh, this seems to be due to more costs per patient, and that patient screening makes up 50 to 70% of the costs. Another challenge is that some cultures, communities, or tribal committees may prohibit participation due to a lack of resources, perhaps an inability to use participatory research, or a distrust of the research agency that's performing the trial. Alzheimer's disease is also complicated, as many of you know, and its cause is still unknown. Now, some trial designs have been a problem or were just inappropriately, inappropriately designed, such as uh, poor phase three clinical trial designs that include a poor choice of the primary outcome measure, uh, the inclusion in some cases of non-Alzheimer's patients, sometimes insufficient accounting for potential Alzheimer's disease subtypes, and there's really not a lot of uh, emphasis on the subtypes, uh, and also therapeutic interventions administered too late. There is also a huge problem with the lack of diversity in Alzheimer's disease trials, like many other clinical trials, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes. Now, inclusion criteria can be too limiting. This can be because they are disproportionately affect underrepresented populations. So for example, many trials include white men, and so they're overrepresented in trials. And also in my trial, the number of medications used uh, that were used together seemed to reduce who was actually eligible. So this was uh, something that we discovered the hard way uh, in my clinical trial. And funding has been a huge problem for Alzheimer's disease research for, and care for many years and really pales by comparison when compared to the support that cancer trials are getting in cancer research. Also, access to trials. We've already touched on this a bit, but access has been uh, alluded to for the rural and remote areas, but it's also a problem if there's no trial partner support or if one does not own a car. So perhaps one has to take a bus uh, to the clinic, and this could be in a larger urban area, so that could be problematic as well. Now, informed 
uh, consent documents are often written in English and and many times they're not always translated into other languages. So you probably don't know this, but according to the Department of City Planning in New York City, there's actually over 200 different languages spoken in New York City, making it the most linguistically diverse city in the world. But in spite of this, on all these languages, it's still a barrier to access because the informed consent documents don't, don't have 200 different languages in which they're written. Now, we already talked about this uh, a bit before, stigma and fear, but concerns about future discrimination in an insurance coverage or the workplace can also occur and make people reluctant to be uh, participate in a trial. Women have also been up underrepresented for decades in clinical trial research, and most drugs, of course, are not sex-specific. And finally, we all know too well about COVID and how the pandemic affected the world, but so does war and so do tsunamis. And this has an effect on clinical trials and clinical trial completion. Now, very much in the news the last couple of years, uh, two or three years, the drug aducanumab um, has been uh, in the media and the news, and it's taken us really on a roller coaster ride with changes in drug company decisions, and also the uh, FDA approvals have been very controversial. Uh, now, interestingly, just a couple of weeks ago, this drug was announced by the uh, Biogen that it will be discontinued. So you will not be able to get this drug anymore um, around the October in 2024. In fact, most Alzheimer's disease drugs have failed and there still exists a huge unmedical, unmet medical need in this regard. Now, as mentioned before, Alzheimer's disease trials do take long, but why is this? And this slide breaks down in more detail what parts of the trial might be taking longer and also how Alzheimer's disease trials compare to other trials. So for example, you can see that Alzheimer's disease trials take almost five times longer overall than when compared to cardiovascular trials. Challenges also often are associated with who will conduct or who will lead the clinical trial. Physicians that participate or work at small community practices aren't always aware of how to break into research, and so they, they don't know how to get it started. There might also be an unwillingness to participate due to the lack of time or resources and funding. And conflicts for some might arise, especially at an academic center, uh, if they're practicing in the role of, of a cl clinician and they don't have protected time as a medical researcher. There also has been inadequate training and a lack of research experience by some physicians that would be necessary for conducting and leading a clinical trial. So thus to encourage physicians to participate in more clinical trials, it's important that they receive the training and have the scope to answer important research questions that would really be in line with their interests and would also improve patient care in their clinics. So fostering a research culture and research-based learning helps physicians to become better clinician researchers. Now the screen failure rate of a clinical trial refers to the percentage of subjects who undergo screening, but do not meet the enrollment criteria of a trial. This is a key driver of costs for clinical trials across disease uh, areas, but especially for Alzheimer's disease trials. You can see in this chart that mild Alzheimer's disease trials have an average screen failure rate of 44%. This is in part driven by the stringent screening criteria of many Alzheimer's disease trials. And in the US, it's related to amyloid beta PET positivity, specific cutoffs or neurocognitive status, uh, and none of these cannot, can be uh, sometimes easily identified. It's also a significant amount of work sometimes, especially for a new site or a small site, to recruit even one eligible subject to a trial if they have not done this before. Now, another important challenge we mentioned has to do with disparities in Alzheimer's disease clinical research. And this is a paper from our team uh, that is the professional interest area that I'm a member of. Its uh, PIA groups are associated with ISTART, which is part of the Alzheimer's Association in the U.S., and we published this paper a couple of years ago. And in this paper, we report on several aspects. So, for example, 
There are many disparities in low and income, uh, low income and middle income countries. There's actually fewer than 1% that are recruited into Alzheimer's disease trials that are Hispanic in the US. And approximately only 2% recruited are African Americans in the United States. African Americans are also less likely to participate and have higher dropout rates in asymptomatic trials. And overall, there's really less than 5% of trial subjects that are from diverse ethno-racial groups. Finally, NIH trials seem to recruit higher numbers of diverse groups as compared to industrial-sponsored trials. Also importantly to note, we mentioned this before, but there are sex-based differences in the occurrence of Alzheimer's disease, and we can't yet fully explain this just by longevity alone. So in other words, the fact that women seem to live longer than men. But overall, about two thirds of those with Alzheimer's in the US and Canada are women. Now women are actually at lower risk for Alzheimer's diseases compared to men before menopause, but their risk triples after menopause. Other differences exist too that are still being studied. So for example, A-beta deposits are found to be uh, more striking in females. And of course, we do not have any sex specific therapies at this time. Now, health disparities based on race and sex extend also to the indigenous populations in the US and Canada. Some of these challenges are culturally based. And in, here's a paper my lab published that uh, talks about some of these challenges with testing new Alzheimer's disease drugs in indigenous populations in both the US and Canada. This included that indigenous populations in both countries are really just like in the US among or just like with Hispanics and African Americans are among the minority populations most influenced by poor socioeconomic conditions. Also, indigenous men and women are very poorly represented in trials, as you could expect. There's also a lack of recognition of cognitive decline by some tribal elders. Potential participants claim findings, though, rarely improve local services. So there's no direct benefit to the tribe or community. So that's something that we as healthcare practitioners need to think about. There's also, in many cases, uh, not there's not easy access. So the distance from the study sites is too far. And then finally, potential participants are not adequately informed of trial. So they just don't know about the possibilities. Now, in this slide, we see a study that actually ranks challenging Alzheimer's disease behaviors. And my mom, of course, um, displayed some of these. You can see that the most common behavior in Alzheimer's disease is agitation and aggression. And another one I highlight in yellow is a refusal to take uh, medication. So later in the seminar, I'm going to talk more about this when we, dis when we discuss how to get important feedback from now, those that with Alzheimer's disease and also their caregivers for better designing clinical trials. Another team, another paper that my team worked on during COVID when our lab was shut down at St. Boniface was to evaluate rest home design. And you're probably aware that many elderly people, uh, especially those with Alzheimer's disease, also suffered from COVID during the pandemic uh, and that were in, you know, living in rest homes or long care term, long term care facilities. We analyzed a number of variables in our interviews with rest home and care home owners and founders around the world. And in fact, you might be familiar with one of the facilities that we investigated. And this is in the Netherlands. It's the so-called Dementia Village. And this has been featured on a CNN documentary. This facility was the first of its kind in creating a safe space for people with dementia to live in a community setting. Overall, though, rest homes have been underutilized for use in clinical trials. So in our study, in our interviews, we found the following. We found that in, in the United States, that clinical research largely excluded rest home populations from randomized trials, and this is related to prevention and treatment of COVID. And this may have set a precedent for future Alzheimer's disease trials. We also found that many rest homes and long-term care facilities were under-resourced, understaffed, sometimes an unstable nursing home industry. Uh, there were complex regulations, both on the federal and state level for oversight. 
And in many cases, there is a need for special protections of the vulnerable uh, for the nursing home population for research. So it made it more complicated in terms of getting an IRB approved. There's also the absence of clinical research experience uh, and an infrastructure in many long-term care settings uh, that can create additional challenges. But overall, this important research has been underutilized, and this is an opportunity if we can figure out how to do it properly. Now, here's a Canadian study that looked into this in more detail. And what they found in their study, which was published, I think, in the year 2018, is that some long-term care owners and administrators refused to allow research to be conducted uh, in their facilities, while others prohibited um, were prohibited from participating due to corporate policies. Residents often preferred treatment over placebo, of course, and they did not always trust the motives of their uh, investigators that were conducting the trial. And sometimes they really just disliked the interruption of their daily routine. Staff time, and that was a constraint uh, and was a major obstacle in arranging for training and execution of research in many of these facilities. And many really saw no benefit to the residents, and they viewed research as an invasion of privacy. Now, in some countries like the United Kingdom, a PI is actually required to be available on site during the interventions. And PIs from outside the institutions sometimes were viewed as outsiders or threats to the facility. So there wasn't any easy solution in that particular case. Other major issues included obtaining uh, consent legally and ethically uh, or withholding of likely effective treatments and the lack of IRB uh, and being familiar with IRB uh, procedures uh, at the facilities. Also clinical trials were described as being more complex and time consuming to set up than observational studies in these facilities, partly due to mortality rates. And then finally, the cost of conducting research in long-term care facilities could be three times higher than studies conducted in community settings or clinics or at academic centers. Now, Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of death, and it's usually ranked in the top six. But when one compares uh, Alzheimer's disease deaths compared to other leading causes of death, we're really losing the battle since Alzheimer's disease keeps increasing. Whereas you can see in this chart, uh, the cause of death rates are actually declining or staying the same for all the other major causes of death. Now, the NIH is the largest government funder throughout the world, um, and it does not support Alzheimer's disease at the same level as other diseases. And you can see that Alzheimer's disease support and funding support pales by comparison when compared to cancer and HIV research. It's just as bad in Canada with even less money to go around. Okay, now let's look a little bit at my clinical trial that was conducted in Winnipeg. So over a period of about 15 years, several investigators, including Dr. Grant Pierce, the former executive director at St. Bonavis Research Center uh, at St. Bonavis, uh, shown here on the left, researched the benefits of flaxseed for heart health. Many investigators, including Dr. Pierce, found a lot of different benefits, including the reduction of blood pressure. This led me to think about the potential there was for flax and brain health. And so I talked to Dr. Pierce and did some research, and I only could find one study, to my knowledge, that looked at the effects of flax on the nervous system, and that was a developmental study. So because of this, I submitted funding, uh, a grant proposal to obtain funding to study flax for Alzheimer's disease. Now, why do we want to look at flaxseed? Well, of course, flaxseed of co uh, contains omega-3 fatty acids, which are also found in fish, and omega-3 fatty acids have been shown to increase learning, memory, cognitive well-being, and also blood flow to the brain. So my trial was designed to investigate the effects of a flax beverage. Some people call it a flax milk, but Health Canada and other agencies uh, don't like that terminology because it actually doesn't uh, have any milk in it. So the idea here was to look at this flax beverage and the consumption of this beverage daily and its effects on memory and cognition in subjects with memory deficits, that is amnesic, uh, the uh, mild cognitive impaired uh, particip participants. 
An additional was designed to correlate PET scan results for a limited number of participants and blood marker, uh, blood biomarker data with memory test results. The study was multi-site, so we had two different sites, double-blinded, randomized, and placebo-controlled to examine the effect of daily flax beverage consumption on memory and cognition. The trial was conducted at the Asper Clinical Research Institute and also at the John Bueller Research Center at the Health Sciences Center in Winnipeg. Now, the participants were randomly divided into two groups, the flax treatment group and the control placebo group. So for six months, these participants took uh, two servings of flax beverage, which resulted in about 30 grams of flax per day or a placebo beverage. And the placebo was an oat beverage. So um, the potential candidates were screened in person at the Asper Clinical Research Institute. And that's also uh, where other uh, biomarkers were measured. And they were subjected to a questionnaire, a medical history, blood pressure measurements, and two screening uh, memory and cognition tests. That is, one is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test, or MOCA, which is sensitive to MCI, mild cognitive impairment, and also the Depression Anxiety Stress Scale, or DAS. Now, based on this uh, and an in-person visit, we determined if participants were eligible to, to continue. Now, the main instrument that we used for testing for cognition, and which was the primary outcome, was CANTAP. And CANTAP stands for the Cambridge Neuropsychological Test Automatic Battery. CANTAP is, uh, consists of 22 computerized tests that can be used on an iPad that measured learning, memory, attention, problem solving, and executive function. These tests are on a touch screen, and which allows for rapid and non-invasive assessment. The secondary outcomes are also listed here in this slide, which included blood markers and PET scanning. Additional details of this trial can be found on clinicaltrials.gov. Now, we just completed the trial, so we're still analyzing the results. So unfortunately, I don't have any results to report just now. But I can tell you a little bit more about the trial. So our recruitment efforts included a TV interview during the summer of 2022. And this is just when the trial was allowed to continue. So we actually got funding, I think, around 2019. And we started uh, to uh, you know, get our other approvals. But COVID shut us down for entirely for two years. It was a major disruption to the trial. And that brings me to, to really talk to you now about some of the challenges that we faced in addition to the pandemic. So these included uh, recruitment challenges, uh, inclusion criteria. I mentioned this a few minutes ago that we excluded a, a variety of patients if they were on a number of different drugs and we were probably a bit too uh, rigorous with our inclusion criteria. Also, our budget projections were off, and we had to get additional funding to supplement the trial. So we just made some mistakes in some of our calculations. Uh, also, government restrictions. Of course, we were shut down for two years, and we had restrictions from the University of Manitoba and St. Boniface, where we weren't allowed to operate. But at one point uh, during COVID, some trials were restarted, but not ours. So even though some of the clinical trials were getting uh, started again, ours is one, the, one of the last ones to actually get, um, get, get going. Also, the other concern was the shelf life of a product. So the shelf life was only for one year. And so with the trial being shut down for two years, we had to resupply our, our flaxseed beverage. And the original cost for the beverage was $70,000. Uh, and this was graciously donated by the Pixie, the Pizzy Ingredients Company. Uh, but we had to get more because uh, some of it uh, went bad, or not, not bad, but it expired. And so we weren't really uh, able to use it. And then finally, storage of the product. When such a large amount of... Um, beverage we and, and boxes of beverage, we had to uh, shuffle around some of our supplies since we were getting it uh, in unusual distribution amounts. They, even though the flaxseed comes from a Manitoba farmer, it was actually processed and packaged in Texas. So there certainly a lot of coordination that, that surrounded that aspect. All right, so we talked about quite a few different challenges uh, with our trial and other trials. So what can we do about it? Well, here's some general ideas. 
So new drug treatments have been slow to come out, of course, like we pointed out, and aducanumab will be discontinued soon, leaving only one other approved drug, and that's lecanumab that you may have heard of. Some believe that by administrating this drug earlier will help to prevent Alzheimer's disease. There are also other non-pharmacological therapies that are being tested, such as electrical and magnetic stimulation. These are experimental, but have been shown to have show promise. And of course, Dr. Zara Musavi, one of my former colleagues, who is a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Manitoba, uh, just published a study on her transcranial magnetic stimulation trial in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So I encourage you to read the results of her trial. Also, the recruiting of more diverse participants will help to not only help the underserved populations, but will also help us to increase enrollment numbers. There are a variety of other new approaches, some using artificial intelligence, like we mentioned a few minutes ago, that might help with increasing the number of correct diagnoses. Also, some newer but complex trial designs might accelerate clinical trial progress, and we'll talk about this more in just a few minutes. But one approach I'm excited about includes combination treatments. And I think the uh, drug companies have been very slow to test combinatory treatments because it's just more expensive and more complex. But what this includes would be combining two or more drugs together, or sometimes combining a drug with a medical procedure, such as with electrical or magnetic stimulation. There's also the idea of private, private partnerships that can invest limited funds into clinical questions about Alzheimer's disease, biomarkers, progression, and treatment that might in some cases be higher risk. Uh, so these sorts of partnerships are very valuable as well. Now, there's a, a number of global initiatives. The one that I'm most familiar with is the National Plan in the United States. This was just updated last year in 2023. And what this is, is a roadmap of a variety of strategies and actions of how health and human services and its partners can accelerate research, expand treatment possibilities, improve care, and support those with dementia and their caregivers. It also is designed to encourage action to reduce a variety of modifiable risk factors. The document for this national plan is free online and consists of about 163 pages. Also, some companies such as Roach are now implementing programs such as THOR, and THOR stands for Treating Health on the Road. So it's a mobile program uh, and involves clinical trials where they invite those with Alzheimer's disease and also their support systems or their caregivers to give direct feedback on several aspects of clinical trial designing. The other thing we need to mention and take more seriously are partnering with faith-based faith organizations, churches and synagogues and so on, mosques, that can help with Alzheimer's disease clinical trials. And they can do this by educating their members, uh, the communities that they serve, about Alzheimer's disease, and also provide assistance with access to care and support. They can also help to explain procedures and results. And this really helps to build trust in the system and the scientific method and creates a bridge between the clinic, those testing the drug with the community. Better strategies overall for designing clinical trials are needed. So for example, better planning can help with Alzheimer's disease drug testing. And this will help to reduce the number of failed or inconclusive trials. Also allowing for more efficient drug development and allowing more drugs to reach patients faster. We talked about some of this and some of these strategies already. Better diagnostics also can help develop and refine clinical trials. And also better planning can help. So for example, uh, example, selecting individuals at high risk of Alzheimer's disease um, and dementia. Also, carefully conceptualizing treatment targets and using the most sensitive outcome measures should help too. So optimizing clinical trial design through quantitative modeling, and as we mentioned a few seconds ago, by the incorporation, perhaps, of artificial intelligence may be useful going forward. Now, new drugs are still attempting to clear amyloid, and some of these are interesting because they differentially clear different types of amyloid fibrils that you can see here depicted in this slide. So perhaps used in combination, this will increase efficacy if clearing amyloid continues to make sense. 
Now, here's an example of an interesting trial I just learned about this week. I, I've seen it before, but I actually saw the PI present on it at the uh, meeting in Washington on Monday and Tuesday. This is called the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network, or DIANE trial, and it's a study to find potential treatments for early onset Alzheimer's disease that are caused by a genetic mutation. So the goal of this DIANE trial is to study how the disease process develops before symptoms appear and to also find biomarkers that can be detected long before symptoms are present. Also, there's some other more complex designs that I should mention. Basket trials are a type of Alzheimer's disease trial that tests how well a new drug works in patients who have different types of dementia. Also, the umbrella trials are another class of design that evaluates multiple drugs in a single disease setting. And then finally, platform clinical trials are also known as multi-arm, multi-stage design trials are a type of randomized trial that compares multiple intervention groups against a single control group. Now here's a new repurposed drug for agitation. I wish they had this when my mom was alive, it would have helped her. It was used before though, it's a repurposed drug and it was used before for major depressive disorder and also for schizophrenia. But it was approved in 2023 for its use in Alzheimer's disease uh, for agitation. So refusing fear and agitation in our Alzheimer's disease participants might increase the number of people and families willing to enroll in clinical trials. Also, patients and caregivers are extremely important, and uh, in the past, they've been largely ignored. However, they can help direct us and help determine which study questions perhaps we should be focusing on. Caregivers can also share data about their own experiences, their own challenges, and the quality of life in their family and those with Alzheimer's disease. This sort of feedback should help us optimize the clinical trial experience for participants and reduce the hurdles to participating. It should also lead to faster enrollment and reduce dropout, and hopefully it will allow drugs to get to market faster for patients who need them the most. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, let me just go over a couple more things. I want to thank all my funding sources, especially the Canadian Agricultural Partnership that funded this trial uh, to a large degree, and also the St. Bonavis Hospital Research Center that supplemented my funding and my budget. Also funding from my donors over the years, such as the Edwards family, and also Senator Everett and his family that allowed me to hold the Manitoba Dementia Chair for almost 12 years. They were instrumental in my efforts to explore new approaches in Alzheimer's disease re research, including my clinical trial. And I also want to thank the various institutes, such as the ASPR, the uh, Health Sciences Center, and St. Boniface for allowing me to conduct my trial at these sites. I also want to point out and thank the members of our team, uh, Dr. Grant Pierce, who is instrumental, to, as I said, the former executive director of St. Boniface in getting me started with flaxseed research, especially now with this focus on brain health. And also Dr. Ed Limitgadam and Ms. Uh, Nancy Olson, who really did most of the heavy lifting with screening and testing patients uh, for the trial and also coordinating the trial. Now, uh, Mr. S. Fahani was an important clinical research assistant that I also show uh, his photo. Now, other members included uh, physicians such as doctors Barry Campbell and Phil St. John that assisted with clinical decision making and monitoring. And a big thanks to doctors Milliken and Morty Rusta for consulting with us on the use of cognitive instruments and in our design of inclusion and exclusion criteria. And last but not least, thank you to Dr. Bernstein, our statistician, and his consultation on statistical approaches, and to Kelly Jorensen, our business director, for helping us manage our clinical trial budget. Uh, so here are some links to follow up some of the ideas uh, that I showed today. Uh, you can go to these sources. And finally, thank you to all the patients, participants, and caregivers, if in case you're listening, along with all the scientists, physicians, nurses, and the coordinators for what you do every day. And I think I'll stop there and entertain any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Dr. Albensi, for sharing your work with us, um, sharing your knowledge and the effort you have put into this beautiful presentation. 
we really appreciate your presence. Um, I think I have um, somebody has a question here. Um, that's uh, Sohel from Bangladesh, I think. Um, just going to unmute him here. I'm sorry, are you going to repeat the questions? Or should uh, I be looking at the chat box? Um, he's going to ask the question directly, just a moment. I'm just trying to unmute him here. So, um, so there's a question I'm seeing here. Uh, it says, for someone early in their research career and wants to contribute to Alzheimer's disease research, what area of research do you think has the most need or could make the biggest impact? I, if I understood the question correctly, you're asking what uh, sector of Alzheimer's disease research do I believe will have the greatest impact? Yeah, for somebody just starting out, you know, um, starting out in research. Just starting out. Well, I think it's good to, um, a couple things. I mean, you have to get well-trained, you get your degrees, you find good people to work with, you go to a good school, such as the University of Manitoba. But there's a couple things. I mean, you you have to get the, you have to take courses and you can get certificates like what Socra offers for clinical research. Also go to the meetings and network with other professionals and learn what's going on. So it's important to do all those things, but one has to be able to pivot. And what I mean by that is that unexpected things happen in a, a research career. So not only do you have to get excellent training and be a hard worker, but you have to have options going forward. And it doesn't matter if you're a physician or a scientist or nurse, you always have to be ready to pivot because no one's research career is linear. So what I mean by that is that there's always unexpected challenges. One of these challenges we just faced was COVID. And so there's always unexpected challenges in a career. So um, always keep other options open in the back of your mind, even though while you maintain your commitment in and serve a purpose in clinical trials, if that helps. Okay, thank you so much for, um, for that answer. Uh, does anybody else have any question before we close? Uh this uh, event today. Okay. I'm trying to unmute somebody here. I don't know. Okay. Okay, there's another question here. He says, why do you, why do you mention sex specific treatment and diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease? Is it because of the part we, is it because of the part we are sex specific? There's a couple of reasons. So women have been underrepresented in clinical trials research for many years. Uh, in fact, people would not be funded if they actually suggested they were going to use women in their research efforts. In addition, female animals have not been used to study mechanisms for many, many years. It's only more recently that, that scientists have, uh, really thought hard about this. And, and now governments and funding agencies are insisting that males and females uh, be included uh, in both basic research and in clinical trial research. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that it should be obvious, but we have to kind of re-say it, is that men and women's bodies do not work the same. We find many sex-specific differences. In my lab, we find many differences in brain metabolism, also in mitochondrial function. We find differences in Alzheimer's pathology. So with regard to the A-beta deposition, we find differences uh, between males and females. And I, the list goes on and on and on. Um, some of my staff are testing sex hormones, both estradiol and androgen, to see their effects on, on, on not only cells, but in our, in our other models to see how this may hurt or help um, different biochemical pathways. So there's a lot we don't know. And the sooner we, we learn more about differences, differences between females and males, the better, and then the closer we will be to uh, really developing sex specific treatments. Does Thank that help? So much. Thank you, Dr. Lebensi. Um, I'm not, I can't see any more question here. I think that would be it. Um, I want to thank you so much for, um, for your, um, 
effort in putting together this beautiful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, thank you for, you know, the presentation and being here, spending your time, uh, your knowledge, you know, to help us in clinical trials. Um, and I, also, I want to also thank the participants today for finding the time to join us today. Um, I know it's lunch time and a lot of people want to be at lunch, but you found the time to join us uh, with, uh, to, to listen to Dr. Albensi. Um, and I want to also let us know that um, we'll be having another SOCRA um, event coming up in May. Um, where we'll be having this kind of uh, discussions, but closer to the date, we'll send out the topic uh, or what we expect that people will be coming to listen to. Thank you so much. And I think that's it for us here. Um, I want to say have a good uh, long holiday. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks for having thank me. You.